we have been studying here at Parkwood Gardens Church the feast days of the Lord. And that's his calendar as he gave to his people certain feast days throughout the year. And they're amazing. They weren't just, you know, do this because I said so. They're amazing in what they point back to and what they look ahead to. And today we're going to study the second of Israel's uh, feast days. If you have that pink piece of paper and want to take it out, let's have a look here real quick. Now you'll remember that the first four of the feast days, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, which is Easter, we'll look at next week, and then the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, all were the early spring days, okay, the spring feasts, and they relate to Christ's first coming. If you missed the first two weeks, you know, you can catch up online. Passover portrays Jesus' death. Unleavened bread portrays his burial. And first fruits, next week, his resurrection from the grave. And then, of course, the Bible says that Jesus will come again like the rains in Israel. And there's a former rain in the spring and a latter rain in the fall. And Jesus will come. He's already come once. Amen? And he will come again. But who does God have with us in between? The Holy Spirit. And God sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, too. So this is exciting. Now, there are still three fall feasts to come, and Jesus will fulfill them. The feasts of trumpets and atonement and tabernacles remind us or point ahead to Jesus' return and his judgment and how we will live with God forever for eternity, all tied to his second coming which will happen. Now in your notes, in your notes, let's talk about these Jewish holidays for a moment. And as we look at all of them, there are several things that we're learning. One, the holy days were given to us by God as appointments between himself and his people. Appointments, things we're to keep, to remember, to put in our calendars, to talk to him, between him and all of his people, because there's a point to each one. He says to Moses, he says, speak to the Israelites and say to them, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies, times to get together. Now, sacred doesn't mean it has to be somber and sorrowful. Now, that will be kind of the tone on Good Friday because we're thinking of Jesus' death. But these are sacred assemblies, times to assemble, to have joy, to look to, have, to God and all that he has done. Indeed, we look both backwards and forwards. In your notes, you've got your pen handy. The feast days look backwards. All of them related to the Exodus and how God brought them out of slavery to Egypt. And they all point ahead, as we saw a moment ago, to the Messiah and what he would do and be. And then, these aren't the feasts of the Jews. They're not the feasts of Israel. They're the feasts of who? The Lord. So they should be celebrated by all people who belong to him said, these are the Israelites, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord. So you'll proclaim them as sacred assemblies, times to gather and remember God and what he's done. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the 15th day of the month of Nisan, which we all know is the month of the car. That's <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you going with me on that. I mean, it's not really, but you know. Now, the 14th is Passover, and the 15th is obviously just the very next day when they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the two are intricately linked, and they even were in Jesus' day because they'd already been celebrated for 1,500 years then. They've become almost kind of one celebration, like Good Friday, Easter is kind of one weekend, and they're closer yet, two days, and, and they're together. Now, the Passover looks at Jesus' death and predicts that, and uh, we have salvation because of that. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread looks ahead to Jesus' burial, and when he buries our sins, really, with him, we have sanctification. Our sins are taken away. And that's amazing stuff that we're going to study. Now, after the Passover night, when the death angel brought that last plague across Egypt. The Egyptians were very anxious to get rid of all these Hebrews. Yes, they had been our slaves, but look at what's happened with all these plagues. And the only provision that the Hebrews were allowed to take out, that they had time to take out, was dough that had no time to rise. 
It was without leaven or without yeast. So when they baked it the next day, it was unleavened bread. And that bread is called matzah in the Hebrew. And it's a wonderful symbol for the Lord Jesus Christ, as we're going to see here in a moment. But before we do anything else, you want to take out that, uh, whichever one of these is pink. Did I guess right? <laughs> if you want to take out that pink sheet, there are two things that I think we need to understand before we study this Feast of Unleavened Bread. Two types that we're going to find here that are significant we need to know. Number one. All right? Number one. Whenever you see Egypt in Scripture, it's always regarded as a type of the world, a symbol for the world, and being slaves and caught up in the world and worldliness, and we're going to see this. It's associated with faithlessness and dependence upon human resources instead of God. Indeed, Isaiah said way later, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they're many and in horsemen because they're very strong, but do not... Look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. And so God constantly says, I'm calling you out of Egypt, not just the slave Israelites, but all of us, out of slavery to the world and trusting the world instead of trusting him. So as God says, come out of Egypt, he's talking to us, come out of the world and into his family, into trusting him. And then secondly, leaven or yeast in scripture is a type of sin. It's a symbol for sin. We're going to look at a whole bunch of passages this morning that all say leaven is like sin in this way. Okay? Leaven, yeast, is like sin in that way. And indeed, when you read about leaven, it always speaks to us of corruption. And how, like yeast, it quickly spreads all over the place. It's a symbol of all that's unclean and evil, if you will. Indeed, the Apostle Paul says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. That's what I've always aspired to be. <laughs> a new lump, right? A new batch of uh, dough there. Just as you are, in fact, unleavened. Leaven or yeast represents what? Sin. So clean out the sin so that you can be unsinful. For Christ, our Passover lamb, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, Paul says. Let's celebrate the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Amazing stuff. So this shows us that, that when Christ enters our lives, there's a cleansing that takes place. That everything unholy and unclean must go, and sanctification, or being cleaned up by God, takes place, and we now live lives that can be pleasing to God. Now, I want us to read the passage, and then I got my alliteration pencil really sharp today, as you'll see. We got four R's that we're going to look at as we examine the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Here's what the apostle, or this is what Moses was told back in Leviticus 23. These are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Lord's Passover, we looked at last week, begins at twilight on the 14th day of that first month. And then on the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. Everybody gather and praise the Lord and do no regular work. For seven days, present a food offering to the Lord. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Ah, so I want to begin our study by considering first, here's the first R, you ready? The requirement of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What was required of the people? Well, we just read it very quickly. First, all yeast or leaven was to be removed from the homes. All of it was removed. Now, seven days, eat the unleavened bread. On the first day, remove the leaven from your homes. Now, you always wonder where spring cleaning came from. Seriously, Seriously, this is where it came from. 3,500 years ago, God said, spring cleaning, clean out your places, and they did that. And the Jewish people this time of year, they'll go through their homes with a fine-toothed comb to ensure that not one bit of yeast is in the house. Now, where do we find yeast in our homes? Yeast is where? In what? Bread? Pardon? Beer? Okay, where else? 
Come on, you missed the most important one. Donuts. <laughs> and cookies, that's right. Get rid of, this is torture. God says, get rid of this stuff. Get it out of your house. Now, there's a point to it. Now, there's a vital truth to this. You see, Passover was, well, and then secondly, after you've got rid of all that yeast, you eat stuff without yeast for the next seven days. Seven days are only to eat bread without yeast. Interesting. Now, this is important. You see, Passover, the day before, was just one day. One day and it's done. And again, the Passover was a type of Christ's death. At Calvary, the work of redemption was done. Our salvation was paid for completely, 100% by Jesus on that day on the cross. Amen? It's not plus this from us. It's done. But there are two feast days out of the seven that are longer than just one day. See, Jesus died. His death is done. Our sin is paid for. But both of these longer feasts, which go seven days, they represent the results. Because you might do something today, but you paint your house. It takes you one day or a room. And then you want the results to last. Amen? Amen. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, and now when we ask him into our lives to help us get rid of the sin, that's not why, but that's part of it, we want that to last. And so these lasting, longer feast days remind us that Jesus died not just so that we could say some quick prayer and buy fire insurance, but so that our lives can reflect that he takes away our sin and our character now is more and more Christ-like. Amen? So that's an important thing. And this unleavened bread is a picture of the character of the believer's life after we become a Christian. Now, thirdly, this high Sabbath, the third requirement, is that it's to be kept as a perpetual memorial. What does God say? On this very day, I brought your people out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, celebrate this day as a what? Lasting ordinance for the generations to come. A lasting ordinance. Now, it's a Sabbath, it's a Shabbat because you're not supposed to do any work. It's a high Sabbath because it's not just the regular every Saturday Sabbath. And do it constantly. Because when you do, you look back to remember how I brought you out of slavery and ahead to look at how I will do that for your whole lives when I pay for sin and the slavery to sin. It's amazing. And keep doing that. Think about it. Every single year, for 3,500 years now, the Jews, as they celebrate this, this Passover, or this uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, remember coming out of slavery and how God wants us to be gone from the slavery of sin, too. So, that's the, re that's the requirement of the feast. Let's look. Second R. Ready? at the ritual of the feast. What were they to do? What was a Jewish person to do to celebrate the feast? Number one, the women, and maybe with the help of the children, would remove all the yeast from the house except 10 pieces. Wow. Now, they had most houses, you know, spring cleaning. They started 30 days ahead, and they're working and working diligently to get rid of every little beast bit of yeast <laughs> and beast to get rid of it all, including everything that might have some yeast in it, too. And then as night falls on the 14th of Nisan, this is Passover, a symbolic ritual cleansing of the house begins. So all the leaven has been removed, except for 10 small pieces that the women uh, and the children will have hidden strategically around the house. And then, of course, the father then removes the rest and burns it outside and claims that he cleans the house. You all know how that goes, right? <laughs> but here's what he'd do. The father would take with him a candle and a feather and a wooden spoon and a paper bag. You say, what? And then the father would go around the house and he would be looking for these 10 bits of yeast that have been left behind. And when he found one, first he would take he, he, and by the way, if there are the modern days, you turn off the electric lights and you, you know, use a candle. And if you found a bit of this yeast, he would take the feather and he would scoop it into the wooden spoon 
and then he would take the wooden spoon and put it into the paper bag, the yeast in the paper bag, and then he, when he got all ten, he would take that outside the house and he would burn it. I love that, because remember, all this is about getting rid of sin, and we want it burned and no longer gone, amen? And the father would say this prayer as he burned it. Any schmutz, or leaven, which is in my possession, which I did not see and remove nor know about, shall be nullified and become ownerless like the dust of the earth. In other words, if I missed any, it's not my fault. <laughs> you know what? I, this makes me laugh and cry because I think that's us with our sin. We're working hard to, you know, maybe self-help, you know, self-help books, trying to, I can be better, and we're trying to do it all our own, but we never can fully without the help of God. Amen? We can never pay for our sin. Only Jesus does that. And, and we might say, it's not my fault, but we have ownership of the things that we do and the thoughts that we think. And hopefully with the help of God, and that's what this feast is about. Those sins are nailed to the cross, buried with Jesus, and the chains to that sin, the chains are broken. So what's the relationship then, thirdly, of this feast of unleavened bread? Because we know that all the feasts not only looked backwards, but they all looked forward and pointed to the Messiah. So what's the relationship of this feast with Jesus, the Messiah? Each one is pictorial, and number one, Jesus chose bread to symbolize his body. You know, this happened even before he was born. Where was Jesus born? In bread town. Bread town. You didn't know he was born in bread town? Where did you think he was born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Yes. Bethlehem is Beit Lechem, which means house of bread. Wow, even before he was born, he was born in the house of bread. And then, that was his beginning, the last night before he goes to the cross, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is, what? My body which is given for you. So he said he represents bread or bread represents him and symbolizes his, his body. And at that night, in that Passover, as he took the bread, and if you missed it, you, you need to check out last week's message online about the Passover. There's three, three loaves of matzah, and he took the middle one out, and this is all part of the Passover meal, and, and broke it in half. And as he took that and broke it, he was even telling those disciples what would happen the next day, using the bread, and why. Because he says, this is my body, which is what? broken there on the cross and why for you as he did that to pay for our sins there on the cross number two the relationship of this feast to jesus is that unleavened bread is a picture of the jesus death and burial not just in the matzah that he used there and and uh broke in half and hid the one half called the Afikoman, and then brought it back later. It was found later, just like his body would be buried and then come back. But Jesus prophesied through the psalmist a thousand years before about how his body would never be corrupted. He said this from the Psalms, Psalm 16. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, or Sheol in Hebrew, nor will you let your Holy One see decay or corruption and what is the symbol for corruption there in the bible it's leaven or yeast indeed and so really when jesus is buried you could say his body was like the unleavened bread in that it was an unleavened or unsinful i made that word up a sinless body that was there and not only there but the jewish people believed that the body started to decay after the third day and of course, Jesus rose from the grave before that could happen. So indeed, his body didn't see corruption either through sin or through decay. And when was Jesus there in the grave? At the very time where they were celebrating the feast of unleavened bread. It's amazing stuff. So unleavened bread is a picture of his burial. Number three, 
and his death. Number three, Jesus chose bread to symbolize our healing and salvation. Not just representing his death and burial, going back to his birth, but it represents his death or his, our healing and salvation. Look at what he says there in John chapter 6. Now, he has fed the 5,000. Remember the story? Crowds following all day. What do we have to give them? Well, little boy's got a lunch, you know, five loaves, two fish. Jesus prays, blesses, multiplies them. Thousands are fed. And then he looks out at them and he says, I am what? The bread of life. Now, your bellies are all full. Now, listen to me. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to, be, comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And whoever eats this bread will, ne- will live forever. Wow, salvation is there. We'll be filled and satisfied for eternity if indeed we are there with Christ. And it's not just our salvation, but our healing too. Jesus takes the matzah. You can see that one a little better. And he uses that that night. He had broken early in the meal that middle piece in half, and half of it gets wrapped and hidden, and the kids might find it later or brought back out. And when that half, which is called the afikoman, is brought back, Jesus took it, and he broke off a piece, as you know, that didn't crumble like that one, And then he passed it around to the next person who broke a piece, and the next one, and the next one, all around the room. And he looked at them and he said, this is my body given for you. Now, matzah bread is significant. Now, remember, they'd already been using it for 1,500 years, and it points to Jesus. It is striped. It is, there are holes in it, okay? It's pierced. It was already broken in half earlier in the meal, and... It's unleavened. There's no yeast in there. And that's all Jesus. Did you catch that? Jesus was striped. The Hebrew word that says that he stripes, heal us, it's stripes, it's wounds. And then he was pierced, hands and feet and side. And of course, he said, my body is broken for you there, just like that bread was. And it's unleavened, just like Jesus' body, Jesus' life was unsinful, no sin, So that when he died, who was he dying for? Us. Not for his own sin. He had none. For us and our sin. And look at what was written 700 years before. He was pierced for for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his stripes, just like on the matzah, We are healed. This is amazing what Jesus did. Remember, from 1,500 years before, there he is fulfilling every little bit, including the bread they use there at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, our lives are to mirror Jesus' life. This was a feast that went on for seven days, which those feasts weren't just a one-time thing, but, but what the results should be. So because Jesus dies without sin so he could pay for our sins, he was buried, the sin buried with him, what should be the results for us? Well, we should be removing the sin or leaven out of our lives today. Amen? You agree? The chains of sin are broken. Sin is paid for. So I started looking, and, and, and Jesus talked a lot about, you know, the leaven, the sin, and how it can spread so quickly and infect us so badly. So I, I've got, again, there's four Ds here. You ready? I've got four places where it talks about leaven that we need to get rid of, four types, if you will, four kinds of leaven or sin that can get in our lives and spread quickly. Here's number one. It's the leaven of hypocritical deceit. Hypocritical deceit. Jesus said that. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Oh, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Well, that's interesting. Now, the word hypocrisy in Greek is hypocrisis, which basically is the name for an actor. It's what an actor does. An actor is one person but pretends to be 
another person. And they wore masks in the Roman days, in the Greek days. And so they were out there pretending to be something they weren't. And hypocrisy is something that Jesus says that too many people, the Pharisees and maybe us, he says, beware of this, we're like that. Now, hypocrisy is maybe professing Christ without possessing Christ. It's about trying to look good, to have a big show before others. Now, look at how Jesus uh, detailed it. He talked to the Pharisees and said, you hypocrites! I'm not pretty sure he was shouting at this time. Really. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. The people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Wow. Now, sometimes I think we feel like hypocrites when we sin. But hypocrisy is not about sinning. It's not about failing to live up to the standard. It's about pretending to live up to standard when I know that I'm not. See, hypocrisy is always about pretense. A little confession for you. I, when I was a teenager, late teenager especially, I, I felt I lived a pretty defeated Christian life. I mean, I was in church all the time. My dad was a pastor. I looked pretty good, you know, and stuff. And I was the head, you know, that time the youth group had a president and secretary and stuff. And I was the president of the youth group and all. But there was stuff in my life that wasn't right. And Satan was constantly whispering in my ear, you are a hypocrite. You're a terrible person. You'll never get better if people only knew. You're horrible. I got to tell you, my life turned around completely when I had somebody come alongside me, when I confessed to them how I felt and what I was feeling, and said, you know what? You're listening to Satan and not the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit will point things out in your life that need to be fixed and encourage you to fix them. Whereas Satan will point out things in your life and say, you are a horrible person, look at this. You ever feel that way? You ever have those thoughts whispering? The Holy Spirit will encourage you. Yes, point out things that need to be fixed, but give you the power, the power to fix them. And that's what this is all about. When I pretend nothing's wrong, that I'm wonderful and fine, that's hypocrisy. And God says, boy, that'll start and it'll grow. Don't let it happen. Get rid of the leaven of hypocrisy in your life. Amen? And then there's a second thing he said. By the way, he said, if we get rid of that, then we can be that unleavened bread with sincerity and truth, not hypocrisy. Now, here's the second place he talks about leaven. He said, there's the leaven of worldly desire. He said, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Her Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Herod, that's interesting. Now, we already talked about the Pharisees, Herod. Now, does he mean one Herod or all the Herods? Because, see, there was Herod the Great, and then he had sons and grandsons, and all of them were like kings and tetrarchs and rulers all around Judah and Galilee. Now, indeed, uh, there's Herod the Great, and Herod Archelaus, and Herod Antipas, and Herod Philip II, who the Bible calls Philip the Tetrarch, and Herod Agrippa the first, and Herod Agrippa the second, and like a wonderful family, they were all horribly bad. <laughs> Yikes. Now, we know Herod the Great. You know him. He was an insecure ruler, a ruthless politician who only cared about his own pleasure and his own power to the point that he killed wives, his own wives, and his own kids, and was willing to kill, you remember, all the baby boys all around the region up to the age of two because some wise men had told him there might be another king of the Jews around. Wow. Luke writes about all the evils of, that Herod had done. Well, he had a son named Herod Antipas, and Jesus called him that fox because of the things that he did. This is the guy who beheaded John the Baptist to satisfy the bloodlust of his mistress, Herodias. Well, that sounds good. And then there's Herod Agrippa I, who the Bible says vexed the church and martyred the apostle James in Acts chapter 12. Then there was Herod Agrippa II, who was the man who tried the Apostle Paul and sent him on to stand before Caesar. This sounds like a great family, doesn't it? And Jesus says, beware the leaven of the Herods. 
okay, so what is that? Well, the Herods were hedonists. And like all hedonists, all they wanted out of life was a good time. It's all about me and what I have and can do and can enjoy. Remember the night before, well, the morning that Jesus, before he went to the cross, and Pilate was trying him? And, and Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee, and Herod was visiting for the Passover from Galilee? So Pilate thought, well, I'll send Jesus over to, to Herod. Oh, when Herod saw Jesus, oh, I've been waiting to see you. This is great. I've heard all about you. And what did Herod want Jesus to do? Do me some miracles. Show me some miracles. This is great. Walk across my swimming pool. You know what? Come on, Herod. Come on, Jesus. I've been waiting to see you. And of course, Jesus, Jesus isn't there for our pleasure. He's not there to entertain us. See, this Herod and all the Herods, they just wanted to be amused. Do you know what the word amused means? A, negative, muse, it means without thinking. Amused, without thought. And I, I wow, I'm kind of saddened by that because I really think that so many people in the world and perhaps many Christians, we thoughtlessly just uh, chain ourselves to the TV or a game console or the shopping mall or hockey and, and, and we're going through life just to be amused and filled with pleasure, and we never stop to think about God, about what Jesus has done for us, about eternity, and if we're truly ready by having asked God to forgive our sins, and now we're living for him more and more sinless every day. Amen? Beware the leaven of the Herods, Jesus says, secondly. There's a third place the Bible says we should watch out for leaven. This is a, boy, this is a tough one. Let's call this one the leaven of moral defilement. Moral defilement. Okay, now, this is quite a story. Let me tell you a little about it. This, this happened in Corinth as the church is growing and spreading. And in Corinth, this sin happens and it's talked about by everybody, both in the church and outside the church. Everybody knows about it. This is a public sin, not just something somebody's privately dealing with. In 1 Corinthians 5, we don't find a Christian who's... who's privately struggling with some besetting sin, but a believer who's open, well, supposed believer, who's openly flaunting an immoral lifestyle. Watch this. Paul says, I can't believe it, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even the pagans don't tolerate. What is it? A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Well, what's the church doing? Well, and you are proud. How could they, po what? Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this? Goodness. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? So clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump just as you are in fact unleavened. Wow. There's somebody in that church, and they're claiming to be a believer, but they're living in incest. Really? He says, even the pagans wouldn't tolerate such a thing, and yet you guys are somehow proud. And I don't know, my heart is broken when I see churches where they're celebrating what the Bible calls immorality, where nobody would speak to somebody else about something that's wrong in their life, in a gentle, loving way, always looking to restore. But no, we get proud of our tolerance, proud of our acceptance of who knows, whatever. And Paul says, wow, that's leaven. If it's sin, it's sin. And if it's there, it will spread. And I think that's not just true in a church. I think that's true in each of us. Boy, Maybe if we stick with this, the word he used was sexual immorality. The word is porneia, where we get pornography from. And maybe, maybe for some, that's where it starts. Something small, and maybe it starts something lustful, and it, and it grows and grows. And Oh, my goodness. Because that's what it does, right? It never starts and goes smaller. Sin doesn't work that way, does it? Never been my personal experience. Starts and grows and grows. 
God says, stamp it out. Just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, look everywhere, get rid of it all. Beware the leaven. Ah. One more thing. Jesus goes back and he talks about the leaven of flawed doctrine, let's call it. Flawed doctrine. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we already talked about the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, but now he says the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and when they wondered what, he clarified, clarified and said the teaching. It's the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees that he's talking about. So what was their teaching that was so flawed that Jesus says it's, a, it's leaven, it's sin that'll spread? Well, for the Pharisees, they believed that righteousness before God could be achieved by human effort, by obedience to the law. If I'm good enough and do all the right things, I can get to heaven. And of course, Jesus says, that's wrong. And the Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standard. All of us. So to be thinking I can somehow be good enough to go to heaven, that is a theology that is flawed, said Jesus. And boy, we need to stamp that out, out of our own lives. When people chat with us, we need to point them to Scripture to see what it says. No, we don't need to be better. We need Jesus and ask him to forgive us. Now, the Sadducees are different. The Sadducees they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. And that's why they were sad, you see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Again, Jesus says the leaven of the Sadducees, they're teaching that there is no supernatural. And I, you know, my heart breaks that there are churches right here in this town who say, Jesus wasn't God. He didn't rise from the grave. Just be a good person. What? Folks, that's flawed theology. And we're in a day and age today when people think theology doesn't matter so much, but to Jesus, it matters immensely. And he said we need to know the word so we know what the Bible really teaches. Because wrong theology is a leaven, it's a yeast, it'll grow and infect the whole church. So what do we need to do? Interesting, he says, study to show yourself approved by God. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God's word is truth. And we need to study it so that we can tell this is off. That's wrong. I know. Now, we don't go around and like, you know, be yelling and screaming at everybody that, you know, what we think is right. But we point to the scriptures because we know them and we've studied them. And we can tell when the counterfeit is there. So what does all this mean to us? What lessons do we learn here from the Feast of Unleavened Bread? And I got three Ps for you. I told you I sharpened that pencil, right? And here's the first one. Primarily, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> it is a stretch, but I'm working it. I had a busy week. Primarily, the Feast of Unleavened Bread reminded the Israelites of their flight out of Egypt and of the sweet taste of freedom. All these feasts, okay, stop laughing. All these feasts look backward and forward, and looking backwards, it reminded them that God brought them out of slavery, and it reminds us today that God brings us out of the slavery of sin too, if we would follow him. And then number two, prophetically, it pointed to Jesus. It looked backwards, and it looks forwards. Jesus, who takes away our sin. Jesus, who was buried without any sin. There was no corruption in his body. Jesus, as John the Baptist says, is the Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. But practically, number three, practically speaking, the Feast of Unleavened Bread addresses a number of issues that might potentially be in my life today. And I think we need to ask ourselves this morning, am I living hypocritically? If so, I need to get that leaven out. Am I surrendering to worldly desires or worldly values? That leaven has to go. Amen? If I'm living for the world and my own pleasure and all that instead of God, that leaven has to go. Okay, just checking. 
Am I guilty of glorying in sin? Maybe my own or maybe the sin of somebody else. May God forgive us. We never should tolerate sin in our own lives or, or uh, open wanton sin even in the church. And then, am I careless in my handling of the word of God? Am I maybe starting to accept some beliefs which aren't true, which are contrary to what God's word says when I know what the Bible says? Or maybe that's what I should be doing, getting to know truly what the Bible says. Well, you know what? I need to remove that leaven from my life. Amen? That sin has got to go, and God will help me if I'm willing. The worship team's going to come now, and we're going to sing one final song. But at the end of that song, I'm going to ask if any of the deacons who are here this morning could just come to the front. And if you want to come and pray with one of them, maybe about one of these things, but about anything at all on your heart, they would be happy to pray with you about that. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that even as we study this little-known feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God, it has pointed us to amazing things about Jesus and how he takes away our sin and and how indeed it was all prophesied even to where he was born and what he would say and do as he buried our sins there. And God, this feast lasts seven days. It's supposed to last. And, and the difference in our lives when we've asked Jesus to forgive our sins, that's supposed to last too. It's supposed to translate into character for us. So Lord, if there are any of these sins, this leaven in our lives today or other things that your Holy Spirit would point out, May we, God, deal with it in prayer. Maybe share it with a trusted friend. And we ask for your power to conquer it in the name of Jesus. Amen.